All right, one last thing I want to talk about here. Uh, This says, says, cannot be used if the matter involves a federally related transaction that requires an appraisal or a transaction occurs in the state that requires one. Not sure what they're talking about, but I'm telling you, we did thousands of them for banks that are federally backed. All right? The other thing I want to talk about is as a broker, licensed broker, you are allowed to do appraisals. Let me say that again, make sure you caught what I said. You are allowed to do appraisals, providing two things. The appraisal is not being used to generate a loan that is backed by a federally related transaction. And you must use the USPAP format if you're going to do it. All right, so you have to follow their outline to make sure that you do exactly what you're supposed to do. I have appraised three properties in my career. All three times it was for the exact same scenario. A guy wanted to buy an insurance policy on his commercial building and didn't know the value of his building. All he wanted was a number so he could go out and get an insurance policy. You guys know where the Goodwill is at Southport and 135? I did that building. The Moose Lodge down here at Averett Road and Smith Valley. Is that a Moose or an Eagles or whatever it is? Uh, beside the Greenwood High School. I did that building just recently. Uh, I've done another building in Greenfield. But you have to follow the use PAP outline or the flow chart so that you can come up with an exact number. So they actually have a process by which they do their uh, appraisal. And like I said before, it starts out with something very basic like defining the problem. Is it an appraisal for acquisition? Is it a limited appraisal? Is it a refinance appraisal? And there are many different types of appraisals that we're not going to get into, but the appraiser would know that. Then they have to define like the scope of work. So what are we actually going to do? Then they get together all of the data. Now there are two types of data they will gather. The first one is general data, which is things about the neighborhood, you know, is it driven by REO market? What's the crime rate? What's the social? atmosphere, is it a declining neighborhood or an up and coming neighborhood? Then the second set of data the appraisal will gather is the specific data. These are the actual numbers on the properties he's going to do. 1,500 square foot, three bedrooms, two bath, you know, yada, yada, yada. So those are the specific data on all the target properties he will be using in this valuation. Then they use one of the three evaluation techniques we're going to talk about to determine the value. <coughs> then they reconcile those values. I'm going to show you how they do it to get the one value at the end. And then they create the report. If you're in the business, the slang for the report is called the 1004. If you look on page 306 of your book, here is a sample copy of the form. It is six pages, legal size. Way down in the very small corner, it says, uh, what's it say? I can't read it. Fannie Mae Form 1004. It's called the 1004. So they'll say, did you get the 1004 done, or we got the 1004, or can you show me the 1004? There's also a 1026. There's all kinds of short form. But we're just going to talk about the main one today, the Form 1004, and there's an example of what it looks like. This is where the opinion would come from. So the URAR, the Uniform Residential Appraisal Report, has all of this data that he has captured, all the general data, all the sp specific data, all of that. Plus, it's going to be accompanied by all of the supporting documents like pictures, maybe police reports, if it's crime area.
This form you can get anywhere. You go out to Google and search Form 1004, you can pull these out, which is exactly what I did when I had to have the form for mine. But you can see as it goes on, it's six pages. So that's the, the Uniform Appraisal Report. They call it the UAR, and this one that said URAR. which they're just thinking about residential. Are we good so far? That's the pretty easy part. Let's get into the fun stuff. Now, we've been using this term here recently called value. Value is controlled or can be manipulated by four different means. And once again, this book loves their anagrams. The four means spell out dust, demand, utility, scarcity, and transferability. All four of these are major factors in the value. If the demand is high for the property, like the lot on Geist when it goes for sale, it never goes at a discount because the demand for it is high it will always maintain its value. Utility. The more different ways you can use a property, the more buyers it could potentially have, therefore it has more value. Think of those houses that are in transition, like on Smith Valley Road, that look like houses, but they say commercial potential available or whatever. All right, so you potentially could sell it as a house or maybe commercial. You have upped the number of buyers, that ups the value. So the utility increases the value. The zoning, changing the zoning, it will have to be done. But what I'm saying is, if it's potential that it could be zoned, you've got commercial guys that may be interested as well as homeowners, all right? So the utility of it can be upped. Now further, go back to what we talked about earlier. Remember when we were talking about all the defeasances that can, you can put? Fee simple, defeasible, where we limit the utility? And I told you there, and you guys all agreed, price will go down. If we say, hey, can't sell alcohol on this, and you can't do this, and which I can do when I sell it, I just make it fee simple, defeasible, that limits the utility because the number of buyers have gone away, lowers the value. Scarcity. You can often tie scarcity into demand. 372 lots sit on Geist, that's it. You want to buy a lot in Geist, there's only 372 in the entire world. Contrast that with, Lydia, the question you asked me about farmland. Millions of acres of farmland. Very, very populous amount. Goes for a much lower price, all right? And then the last one we've touched on, and I've kind of set you up with my left hand for this right hand knockout, transferability. I've been playing rope-a-dope three days with you now. How easy can you transfer the property? Remember, we're in the financing section, and yesterday we talked about, oh, what happens if I have more liens than value? The transferability goes down, therefore the value is zero. And if you think back, I literally slid that in and nobody questioned. I said, yeah, it has no value because you can't transfer it. All right? So theoretically, that value is only to the person that currently lives in it, to everybody else, since they can't clear the liens. All right. So let's talk about a couple different terms here. This is the one I love. Market value. You ready? I have to take a deep breath. Market value is the most probable price at an arm's length transaction given knowledgeable buyers and sellers without undue pressure for cash or its equivalent in a stable market. Got it? No. <laughs> I don't think I can do it again. 
Market value is defined as the most probable price. Not the highest price, not the average price, not the price you want it to be. It's the most probable price with knowledgeable buyers and sellers. For instance, I was dealing at one point with a guy out of California to do a reality show here in Indianapolis about commercial real estate. And he said that he really wanted to do small deals, you know, like $10 million and up. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, time out. I said, you can buy Indianapolis for $10 million. And he's like, what? I'm like, yeah, dude, I can buy commercial property here for 500000 a million. He's like, are you kidding me? So he had no concept of our market. So given knowledgeable buyers and sellers, all right, at an arm's length transaction, once again means what? I'm not related to him or I have no passion for that other person. So it's debating, it's between true people that don't know each other. Without undue pressure, you cannot be pressured into the sale. Foreclosure is a strong pressure for cash or its equivalent. Meaning if you traded somebody something, it might not be true. So what I'm telling you is this. Market value to get the true value of a home has to meet all of these requirements. Let's go back and look at some. Would you sell the house cheaper to your mother? Yes. So if it's not an arm's length transaction, that's not the true value of the property. If you have high pressure, like foreclosure, would you take the first offer? Yes. That's not a true value then. If you're dealing with people that are outside of our market and are not knowledgeable, and you tell that guy, hey, $2 million, and he thinks that's a deal because he's used to that market, that's not a true value. So that's what we're trying to get is true market value, and it has to have all of these considerations. When that happens, you will end up with a range of values. I had a listing several years ago, married couple with children. He was in the military. He was in the military and was at, thank you, Atterbury. Attaboy. He called me and said, hey, I'm going to get redeployed. I want to put my house up for sale. We said, okay, no problem. He said, don't worry. I got like eight months. They're just prepping me on this. So we list the property. We're into it about a month, and he calls me back, and uh, dude, the Army changed their mind. I'm leaving tomorrow. He said, but my wife's going to stay, stay here, finish the school year out with the children, and take care of the sale. Then we're going to sell the property. They're going to move it out with me. I said, okay, no problem. End of the school year comes. No sale comes. Nothing. We had the uh, appraisal, or my comps were between 154 and 159. We had it listed at 154.9 right in that range. About the middle of the summer, she called me up and she said, I'm done. She said, the next offer I get, I'm taking. The kids miss their dad. I miss my husband. I don't want to be here. I'm taking the next offer. So we got an offer at like 146. She said, take it. I'm not even going to counter. I said, but you know you're leaving equity on the table. She said, I don't care. We've got the money. My husband makes good money. We're moving. Why was that number lower than my range? Because the definition of market value broke down insofar as that undue pressure went away. She had great pressure to sell. So her value did not end up being in my range because I did a range of market value, which is what you guys will do when you pull your CMAs. If that market value breaks down for any of those reasons, you could end up with a number less than what you think. Now, why is that a big deal? That's a big deal because when you go to pull comps, you shouldn't use that house. 
because that's not giving your client fair shake on what their value is. The question was, how would you know? That's the problem. There's an old computer programming term called garbage in, garbage out. When agents close the property, they're supposed to put some notes and stuff in so that you can do that. Plus, once again, we get to the art, and you start seeing a house in Center Grove, and you see 12 houses sold, 180, 180, 180, 180, 140, 180, 180. You're going to go, wait a minute, something's wrong with that 140. And I literally have had, and I have done in my career, called other agents. Hey, you remember that listing you had over there? What went wrong? Oh, yeah, I remember that. And they'll usually tell you. And I've had people call me. Hey, I'm trying to justify my price. You sold the house. Why, how did you get that price? Well, here's what we did. Oh, okay, that'll help me. Are there confidentiality concerns? Well, yeah, I mean, you still owe confidentiality to your client. I mean, if you, if I called you and your client was the one where he said, and my wife's I'm pregnant and the cat's on heroin and the dog ran away, you can't tell me that. But you could literally say something to the effect of market value broke down. Okay, that's all I really need to know. In general, in the long run, that's really all I care about. For whatever reason, doesn't really matter. All I know is the value you got probably is not a true value anyway. It's like answering not eligible for rehire. Nope. Yes. For rehire. Yeah. <laughs> Did you fire them? Can't answer that. Would you rehire them? No, we would not. And that's all I need to know. Let's change the audio.